and that I got involved one in the early nineties and uh it was it was it was a disaster. Um and um I, I, you know, I'll be honest, I was imbued as many young men in the early twenties with overconfidence and a, a healthy dose of arrogance. And it was um and it was my undoing. And um very, very quickly, within the space of eighteen months, I had uh, I was hugely in debt, and uh, I was forced to sell my home at a loss. Had my credit cards taken off me and ripped up, and uh, had to go and seek advice from the Citizens Advice Bureau on how to handle so much debt. No one's ever said that running your own business is going to be an easy journey, and certainly, Nick, who always wanted to run his own business certainly found out the hard way that it isn't easy. But one thing's for sure, he still succeeded despite some of the challenges that he went through. So do listen to the whole podcast and you will discover some really interesting ideas that Nick talks about. I just love the way that he articulates these in such a simple way for all of us to understand. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Nick. How are you today? I'm very well indeed, Michael. How are you? I'm really, really great. And we're waking up today on a really freezing cold day. I'm in the oh, Midlands. Yeah. You're up north, and I think temperatures there have gone down to like minus five or something ridiculous. Well, 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 well. You say I'm up north, but actually I'm not today. Oh. Today I am in one of the home counties. I am in Surrey today. <gasps> I where, love is Surrey. Where I am? Yes, 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 yes. Because I'm in. Yes, because I start my working week in London this week, so I'm in Surrey as we speak. Oh well, I I lo I used to live in Surrey, so okay. Um, for that's where I moved when uh, when my family moved from Amsterdam, we moved to Farnham in Surrey. Oh right, okay. So that's uh, just on Hampshire border, I think, isn't it? That's right. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Famous British Air Show. Farnborough. Oh, and that's Farnborough, isn't it? Yeah, that's farm. So it's very close. They're very close together. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. So I have very fond memories of Surrey. Actually, splendid. Splendid, splendid, splendid. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more of your story. And I have to say, I heard a little bit of it already some mm. months ago, but I'm looking to forward to, to hearing more of it. So I start with the same question on every podcast to get us going, and that okay. is, tell us a little bit about your personal life. So where were you born? Uh, a bit about your education. Did you move around abroad or in the UK? Obviously, where you now live. We had a obviously a hint where you're working at the moment, but yes, um, just to give people a sense of a bit of background, and then we get yeah. into the kind of business side of things. Okay, I was actually born in Bolton, right in uh, Lancashire, just outside Manchester, but lived until I was six years old in Banbury in Oxfordshire. Oh yes. So so up until I was six, I was I spoke posh, Michael. I used to say bath and grass <laughs> and glass. But then uh, mother and father uh, split up, divorced, and and mum took me and my younger sister north. So where I was raised in North Manchester, which so so your listeners in the UK will probably detect uh, a Mancunian accent. Right. So uh, I kind of that's where I was raised and schooled was was Manchester. In fact, I stayed in Manchester until I was uh, thirty two when I moved to Edinburgh. Um, and now I live between Edinburgh and Surrey. And the reason behind that is because my, my new partner, um, Sally, she lives in Surrey. So so I, I we, we live between two places now. Wow, that's a massive distance. <laughs> yes. It is, but thankfully EasyJet will get you from Stansted to Edinburgh Airport in an hour. God <gasps> bless them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If they decide to go on time, obviously. Um, but it's it's still an hour. So 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 that's it. Did I move around? Um, so I was in North Manchester in a terraced house, uh, very much like a Coronation Street kind of street with a corner yeah. shop. Yeah. Um, until I was in uh, until I was seventeen or eighteen. Then we moved to uh, we went up up in the world, Michael. Anybody that knows Manchester 
although if I sell them, I, I lived in Presswich, but then we moved to Altrincham. They'll yes. they'll, they'll realise that was a, that's a huge step up. Yes, that's, that's massive. Yes. Um. So I uh, lived in Cheshire, North Cheshire, South Manchester for a little while. Yeah. Um. And, and there I stayed really, just moving round parts of Manchester, different parts. Timperley. Um. Lived in Timperley. Lived in Worsley. Um, and then moved up to Scotland in, in March 2000 is, right. is what we did, yes. And, March and where, 2000. So were you educated then Manchester way? Yeah, I was uh, in uh, last of the grammar school intake. Those of your listeners of a certain age will recall the F11 plus and, uh, and I did the 11 plus and passed it. Uh, I went to a school that was... Uh, that was, was demolished and is now a housing estate in Whitefield. Mm rather ignominiously um but uh, yeah so that's where i schooled but d- then didn't go to university just went to uh, central manchester college that right. too has been bulldozed and wow. uh, made uh, yeah i'm starting to take this personally wherever <laughs> seat of learning if you, if you can call central manchester college a seat of learning because i don't think you can um <laughs> that's been flattened and turned into apartments now as well so there we are wow and and what so from college was there some specific uh, course you did at the college? I did. I I, I managed. Uh, I managed uh, at my first college to do uh, six months of A levels and then gave them up because they were too hard. Mm. So so what I did at Central Manchester College, which is a different college, is um, I did a B Tech National Diploma in Business and Finance with Travel and Tourism. Wow. Yeah, travel and say, tourism wow. was important. <laughs> <laughs> well, back in the day, travel and tourism involved knowing out how to fill out uh, uh, the, the booking form for a ferry uh, <laughs> when things were done, <laughs> and a booking form for a hotel. You know, when people used to go and look at brochures and then go into a travel agent and go, "We'd like two on half board for four for you know for three weeks in this mm. particular hotel in Magaluf." or whatever that 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 was the sum total yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah it'd be completely useless anything that i ever learned there would be useless because it's all online and on an app for god's sake yeah absolutely mm-hmm. and what did you do after that well the the reason i actually went i, I wasn't too interested in the travel and tourism element mm. uh, what, what what drew me to a b-tech national diploma in business and finance michael was the fact that when i was 14 i knew that i wanted to be self-employed Wow. Uh, yeah, at 14. Um, it's incredible. <laughs> well, I don't know whether it's incredible, it's just, it, it, but, it, but it's a fact. I, I was, I, I'd done a paper round for a little while, and that, I'd, uh, that didn't really do it for me, delivering papers. So I decided to start a car washing round uh, when I was 15. And, it mm. was, uh, and I used to wash cars on a Sunday. Mm. And, um, and it was whilst I was, I was peddling down Berry New Road, um towards towards, towards uh, uh cheatham hill um mm. or thereabouts sedgley park actually um when i was on my bike with my bucket and my sponge and i thought you know I, th- I want to work for myself for a living that's what i want to do when i'm an adult i want to run my own business i like this being self-employed business yes so 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 i went and did the b-tech national diploma in business and finance because i thought well i better learn about business because i'm going to start a business mm. so so i did when i was 19 Wow. And what was the business? The business was with a mate of mine called Rob, who I'd met at college whilst doing that that, that business and travel and tourism course, was uh, a sandwich delivery round. Uh, um, we, we, we made sandwiches and, uh, and we delivered them to offices in and around Manchester, Dress, dressed in dinner suits with black patent shoes on. That was our... That was our USP. We'd never heard of USPs at the time. No. Uh, but 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 that was it. That we we dressed in dinner suits and. What, um, what made you yeah. to d- decide to dress in dinner suits? I have no idea, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. We just what I don't know. I, I think we had this idea that it was going to be a high brow yeah. kind of service. We called ourselves the Sandwich Company. Right. Um, and it was Great going to name. be a, a high end kind of high class kind of thing. Mm. And, um, yeah, do you, do you know what? We, we started that in 1986. Wow. And uh, which is a long time ago. But that's the same year that Pret-a-Bonger 
started. Um, they Pretamonje fared a little better mm. than than Rob and I. Some yeah. of your listeners may have noticed, um, <laughs> but it does vindicate our decision that 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 sandwiches was the way to go in 1986. <laughs> it's just that yeah, we didn't do so well as Pratt. But uh, I guess you saw some trend there, and you. Well, you perhaps were the first one who started it, so uh, yeah. Hi, well, yeah, just really decent quality sandwiches. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe. So it was a great learning curve, but we only did it for about a, a year and a bit. Mm. Um, but we ended up with premises in the back of a, a bakery shop and mm. and and things like that. And it's it's like you know, I meet people who wish to be self-employed, and they think a lot of them, in my experience, feel as though they should get. You know, you, you, you need training yeah. um, to do this. And, and someone asked me recently, well, you know, what did you do to start a sandwich business? And the, 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 the simple and honest answer to that is we simply went out and bought some bread and bought some ingredients and made sandwiches and then knocked on the doors of offices and went, hello, can we deliver sandwiches to your offices? Yeah, yeah. That's how you start a sandwich business. Incredible, yeah. <laughs> making it making it very very simple. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, it's not difficult to make sandwiches, is it? No, no. I think everybody knows how to do that by now. Yeah, that's right. So then it's just a case of well, let's let's go around some posh offices and knock on their doors and go, is it all right if we knock on your door every day and see if any of your employees want to buy sandwiches? And guess what? Everyone goes, yeah, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, the reason it lasted for a year and a bit was because you were bored with it or no, well there's a lot of getting up at four o'clock in the morning if you're going to make sandwiches fresh and deliver them yes uh i, I the, the the simple answer to that is and, and it's a lesson that i learned is that we didn't charge enough money for our sandwiches mm. because and there is a there is that there is a logic to this is that if you can make your sandwiches for as little money as possible, you will sell more of them. You know, there's a logic to, you know, you know, if you if you can sell a sandwich, if you can charge a sandwich out at 50p rather than a pound, you'll sell more. Yes. But you cannot then get the quality. Yeah. And you then don't make any money. Mm. And again, anybody who is familiar with Presa Monge will know that their sandwiches and soups may be delicious, but the one thing they are not is not is inexpensive. They yeah. are very expensive. Yeah. Um, and that was a lesson that uh, that I really learned and carried through to other businesses. Is uh, we just didn't charge enough money. We were obsessed with trying to have the quality but at a low price and the two things are not compatible. You get yeah. what you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> right? And what's more, you realize that actually a lot of people at lunchtime don't really care how much they're paying for a sandwich. Mm. Again, witness the, the, the queues in pret a And I mean, I've never been in a pret a at lunchtime. That isn't absolutely mobbed. Mm. Um, so there we are. So that's why it didn't work out. We were young and we were naive, but gosh, we learned some lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then what happened after that? Well, uh, Rob and I went our separate ways. Um, um, I And I went into sales because I had enjoyed the selling element. Uh, Rob didn't really. He enjoyed the finance and all the bookkeeping and all that, all that kind of stuff, mm. which wasn't my forte. And, and still, I mean, I do manage it, although I give all my stuff to, to a bookkeeper, Diane, and she does all my stuff because I can't yes. be bothered with things like that. Yes. But I went into sales and I became a sales rep. And that's, that's what I did because mm. I liked selling and, 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 you know, selling is the nearest you can get to self-employed without being self-employed in that as long as you are, hitting your targets actually your sales manager doesn't really care what you're doing mm. as long as you're hitting your numbers so my first sales job was selling ad space in a big uh, industrial directory yes this is what i did and uh good fun it was too and then how did it progress from there then nick well um they, I, I, I tell you what made me move from from there was was the lure of a nicer company car. 
um it's 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 for most people cars aren't that much an important thing but for sales reps cars are everything because there's an awful lot of status yes within within which car you are driving which now seems terribly shallow and awful but it is true i was recently mm. working with the sales force and uh, i tapped into that and their sales manager said you know you're so right nick you know sales reps are just obsessed with what car they're driving so i was driving a, a lousy Vauxhall astra which was the base model um it was it was dark green with a beige interior and it didn't even have a clock mm. um and somebody literally dangled the keys of a Vauxhall cavalier lxi in front of me in black with alloy wheels and, and a sunroof and it was it was too much to, to <laughs> To resist yes. and um, and i got into um um uh, selling the leasing and rental agreements on office equipment specifically actually fax machines so again there's a blast from the past mm. so selling the finance agreements on those things that's what i did next wow yeah so that was quite a technical sale then was it in terms well, of it the was, finance, uh, no, then. no, because actually somebody else had gone in and sold the um, someone else had gone in and sold the um, the the fax machine yes. on a rental agreement. And then we came along and changed that to a lease agreement. Yes. Uh, so I was just getting people to, to move from rent to 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 lease. Um, yes. I did then go on to move on to um selling phone systems so yes that was more technical i had to learn how to put phone systems together and configure those to sell them yes yeah yeah so that was my progression uh in, in into proper telecoms and then uh, i left that and went self-employed again <laughs> oh wow yeah yeah doing yeah. what well it was it was i got involved in a big multi-level marketing uh company um mm. some of your listeners may not be familiar with mlm uh, and yet many of them will have heard of um oh gosh what are they called uh da, 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 the name escapes an absolutely huge american mm. amway amway yes Yes. It's a big uh, MLM firm, as is Herbal Life. That's is a right. Big one, yes. Which are perfectly legitimate. Legal people go, oh, that's pyramid selling. And it's not. I mean, these are perfectly legitimate uh, businesses. Mm. Uh, but I got involved in one in the early 90s, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was a disaster. Mm. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, I'll be honest, I was imbued as many young men in the early 20s with overconfidence and a, a healthy dose of arrogance yes and it was um and it was my undoing and um very very quickly within the space of 18 months i had uh, i was hugely in debt and uh, i was forced to sell my home at a loss had my credit cards taken off me and ripped up and uh, had to go and seek advice from the Citizens Advice Bureau on how to handle so much debt. Mm. So um, that was, um, they say, pride become, comes before a fall, and that, 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 that was the case with me, Michael. Mm. Yes, I've, I have some experience with MLM as well. Do you? <laughs> I've yes. been there, yes, I've got yeah, the T-shirt. Yeah. There we are, there got we are. The thankfully, I, thankfully yeah. I no longer have the T-shirt, so I think no. I threw it away in disgust. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. But many people have experienced uh, multi-level marketing, haven't they? So, yes, they uh, have. They have indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah still yeah. get many requests today. Yes. I guess. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, um, uh, there's a. We went on um, just a tiny little story. There's a guy in mm -hmm. Australia, and hopefully he'll listen to this. I won't mention his name, but he's been kind of luring me for like a couple of years he keeps sending me a message on facebook messenger and says because i said to him never ever ever never ever ever never ever again and he keeps sending me a message going never ever question mark and i just go back yes never ever <laughs> again <laughs> <laughs> oh god so yeah. wow that that's a tough tough period to go through for sure yeah it was tough um, yeah yeah it was yeah yeah, how did you get out of that? Uh, I went to work at Russell and Bromley, which is a very posh shoe shop. Um, I went to work in their Manchester 
office at office that's not right shop yes uh, um, um thankfully i was in a relationship with a wonderful woman at the time who was a sales rep and she earned fairly decent money um and but but still we had to move to a, a horrible part of manchester and rent a really awful awful flat that we couldn't afford to heat mm. um and what i did was i worked full-time at russell bromley selling shoes and i went and uh decided to uh, go and do a law degree and uh, endeavour to become a barrister, is what I decided to do. Yeah. So I, I studied on a, a Monday night and a Wednesday night um, uh, for five years and then did the sixth year full-time to do what they called the BVC, Bar Vocational Course, which is your professional training to become a barrister. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was called to the bar six years after starting learning uh, a law degree mm. uh, and all the time working full-time at Russell and Bromley. Wow. Apart from the final year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And why why law? What inspired you to go in that direction? Well, there are a couple of uh, reasons to that. One, because up until that point, I felt that I'd never really completed anything. So I'd done, you know, seven months of A-levels, given them up. I'd had a go at the sandwich business, given it up. I'd sold advertising space, but I'd only done it for a year. Uh, I'd done the telecoms, but only done it for 18 months. And I just felt I, I hadn't finished, start, completed anything I'd started. Yes. I wanted uh, more security, but I still wanted to retain being self-employed. And barristers in England and, where, well, in the UK are self-employed. Mm. Um, so that ticked a box. So the, the degree was to test myself to see whether I could start and finish something. Yeah. Uh, and and the going to what and I thought, you know, if you're going to do a degree, do a, you know, um, for want of a best expression, proper one. Yes. That is really testing. And at the end of it, you know, you get in inverted commas, a proper job. Yes. Um, so, so that it was very personal reasons that I went and did law and aimed to become a barrister. Very personal. Mm, absolutely. Well, mm. particularly after what you'd gone through. So this this was almost trying to, what sounds like, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but trying mm-hmm. to prove to yourself that you were capable of being a success. After having gone through a failure of that magnitude, it was almost... Yes, I think that's, I think that's, that's, that's right, Michael. Mm. I think that's fair comment, yes. Mm. Yeah, and that was a very important thing that I had to do. Mm. Yeah, I kind of really sensed it, gut gut feeling deep down, you know, you must stick, do something and stick at it, come hell or high water. And, it, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing because actually, and, and I'm sure some of your listeners, maybe many of your listeners will relate to this, but actually if you can achieve something that you thought, because I was not academic at school, I mean, I was really not academic. So, so, so I've got myself through and, and passed our law degree and the professional exams to become a barrister. Actually, it gives what it, what it gave me tremendous confidence in terms of right. Well, what else do I want to achieve? Because yes. actually, if I've managed this, I can bloody do anything. I know. Yeah. I mean, that's what it gives you. If you can do this, then then wow! Suddenly, you think, whoa, I can do anything now. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and that's what that gave me, without a doubt. Yeah. Oh, that it sounds brilliant, and it sounds. I mean, how how many years did it take to do that? All together, it was six years. Mm. That, Which, that's a massive know, investment of time, but really, it isn't in the in the big scheme of things. Well, no, it, it, it it's funny, isn't it? Because I started that at what twenty six. So, you know, when you're a 26 year old and you're looking at finishing something when you're 32, that does seem like, I mean, that's just forever, you know, isn't it? Whereas, uh, you know, I'm 51 now and I think, God, six years is just going to fly by. I just, because I tell you what, the last six years has flown by. Yes. Uh, I mean, (laughs) and I'm sure a lot of you listeners can relate to that. The last six years has just gone, well, bloody hell, where did that go? Yeah. Um, but if you're sitting here right now and you go in this is and you and you're going to embark on something, you know, let's say on the first of November, and you know you won't complete it until twenty twenty four, that's a hell of a stretch in front of you. You think, mm. bloody hell. Mm. But it doesn't half go quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean it really goes. Uh, and actually when you're young, when you well, when you're old and you look back, thirty two is still no age whatsoever, for goodness no. sake. 
No, but it isn't. you don't think that when you're 26, of course. Definitely not. <laughs> you think Definitely. it's ancient. Yeah. And then, so having qualified as a barrister, mm -hmm. you still need to get work, right? Yes, you do. And if you're going down the route of becoming a barrister, what you have to do is you have to obtain and secure a pupillage, is what it's called. Uh, yes. Strangely enough, in Scotland, it's called de a devilment. Uh, but uh, yes, rather peculiarly, um, it's called a devilment. Um, but in in England and Wales, you secure a pupillage, and they are they are very hard to come by. When I was applying for them, and I have no reason to think it's changed, but you would get between eight hundred and one thousand people for apply, applying for one pupillage. Yeah. So, needless to say, um, I did not get a pupillage, but I did manage in a very very unorthodox way uh, managed to get uh, into uh, what was a very large national law firm in their Manchester office yeah working in their health and safety and environmental team mm. yeah but I didn't go the normal route to get that but I, I, I got in well so, done. so so that was yeah so that was good that was good that was good that was good yeah and I got in there. And uh, I loved being a lawyer so much that I did it for six months. Because <laughs> oh, there's no, well, there's no point in studying for six years and not making a real go of it, is there? No, absolutely um, not. And I thought, I thought six months was more than enough right. of having to account for, for what I was doing every uh, every six minutes of my life. Um, and, and was it because it was being employed and accountable to somebody else, or? An element of it was that, without a doubt. An element was I missed the selling. Yes. Uh, I'd just come out of a very high-end retail environment through Russell and Bromley. Yeah. And for the first time in my life, I was sitting at a desk. And right. I discovered quite quickly, at least, I mean, actually, after that, for the next six years, I was going to sit at a desk, albeit doing a completely different uh, role. Uh, mm. But at least I was sitting at a desk that was in my business. Um, so it didn't seem so onerous, but sitting at a desk in somebody else's office, I, I didn't no, I didn't really like it, no. to be honest. No. Um, it wasn't for me. And I'd become a father for the first time, and, um, and it was very, very clear to me that if I was going to be um, if I was going to be successful in law and carve out a career in law, then I wasn't really going to see him grow up. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it becomes, honestly, like it becomes a choice between working all the hours God sends or going home and reading Thomas the Tank Engine. Yes. And uh, reading Thomas the Tank Engine 1. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and I've no regrets there whatsoever. No, good for you. Mm, yeah. Mm. I'm sure if I carried on in law, I'd be earning uh, an awful lot more money than I earn now. I need de decent money now, mm. uh, which is nice, but I'd be earning an awful lot more. I'd, mm. I'd probably be a partner in a big law firm and they earn silly, silly money. But uh, no, it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. But it was a massive decision again and, a, you know, like a pivot in terms of making that choice because you're right, if, if you were just all about the money, mm. then you would have stuck with it and gone, you know, this is going to earn me a bucket load. I've got to stick at it. Yes. And and that's a good point. But what I had learned um, by having such a fall from grace with the multi-level marketing company um, and the previous sales jobs, which is if you chase money or if you ch chase material wealth, it, it doesn't end well. Yeah. So far better to do something that you like doing mm. and either the money will follow or it will not follow. Because, you know, I still say, I mean, I love what I do now, mm. but I still say that my favorite ever job was working in Russell and Bromley in Manchester. Yeah. I mean, I, I have never laughed so much in all my life. It was an absolute joy, but I didn't, I hardly earned any money at all. Mm. But they were great. I mean, they were just wonderful years that I look back with, with great fondness. But chasing money is 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 a, is a route to 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 unhappiness. There's no yeah. question about that. Yeah. And that that I think a lot of people wake up to that.
Um, yes. But they find out they find out the hard way, and of course, lots of people believe that running your own business is a route to money too. Which, of course, it doesn't necessarily mean. It no, I, I, no, I think that's right. I think the vast majority of self-employed people are one-person businesses, one man, one woman businesses, and and they don't earn a lot of money at all. Mm. Um, and and they work every hour God sends. Now, as long as they like that and they're enjoying it, then then that's okay. Yes, that, that's all right. Um, I'm lucky. In what I do is just in a market that that pays. Uh, very well, which is, which is a wonderful thing. But even if it didn't, I'd still do it. Yes. Um, and the other thing I would say is the day that I stop enjoying it, and, and don't get me wrong, there are days when I don't like it, when I'm, oh, God, I can, I can do without this. Mm. Okay. But overall, I really, really love it. But if I found after two or three months, like, no, I'm just really not enjoying this. Seriously, I would stop doing it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, because the flash car can go the nice watches can be sold mm -hmm. i'll downsize to a smaller house because that's the other thing having having been right at the bottom having been you know lived in a horrible crappy flat in a horrible part of manchester and not being able to afford the heating mm -hmm. and having to walk into a shoe shop it doesn't ba bother me with no. me and my new partner and we discussed this recently you know if we both had to downsize you know sell sell a house get rid of the cars and work in a shop then that's what I would we would do. There are yeah. far worse things than doing that. That's right. It's it's not the end of the world if your business doesn't work out. No. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Go and drive a taxi. Yeah. You know, there's loads of stuff to do. Go and wash cars again. You know. Yes. So so after so you decided to go and spend some time with Thomas the Tank Engine. I rather, did. <laughs> yes. And then when you when you'd done enough of that, what did you decide to do after that? Well, well, what happened was as I as I, I realised very quickly that I wasn't going to enjoy what I was doing in the environment and what I was doing in in this law firm. I mean, it's you just you just get a gut feeling. You just you think you just instinctively know this is this is not this is not for me. Yeah. Um. And I was thinking, oh God, what am I going to do? And actually, my sister. Uh, was working for uh, a large national uh, recruitment agency, recruiting accountants, and she was up in Scotland. And she said, "Look, Nick, she said, I'm going to leave." She said, "And start my own recruitment business." She said, "Why?" She said, "Why don't you join me in Scotland?" She said, "And you can recruit lawyers, and I'll recruit accountants." Right. And I, you know, and I have to say, I was very reluctant at first. I really didn't want to get into recruitment, but she persuaded me otherwise. And I went, OK, so we left Manchester in early in the spring of 2000. So me, my, my then wife and our, our only son, George, and we moved lock, stock and barrel up sticks from Manchester and moved to uh, the countryside just outside Edinburgh. And uh, I started a, a recruitment business with my sister and a, and a, and a colleague of hers. And, and, and that's what we did. Mm. So self-employed for the third time. Yes. And by the time I was 32. And she had experience in recruitment, did she? She did, yes. She'd been yeah. recruiting accountants. Yes, I had none. No. But it's a bit like sandwiches, you know, and, and I'm not, that's not flippant. Seriously, it's like how difficult can it be to start a recruitment business? And the answer mm. is it isn't. No. Um, you know, I remember the first, you know, what you have to do is you have to get clients and you have to get candidates. Yeah. Well, you get candidates by advertising. I mean, all of this is online now, but you still, you know, you're advertising online. Um, and then you have to get some clients. And that's all that is about is just phoning people up and going, hello, we're starting a recruitment business. Can I come and talk to you and find out how you go about recruiting your people mm. and see the whether what I do might be of any help? And, you know, I remember the very, very first HR director that I phoned or that I called um, – in Glasgow at uh, one of Scotland's largest law firms. And I said, and, and I said, I'd like to come and see you, find out how you go about recruiting. I've just started a recruitment business. I just moved up to Scotland. And she said, she asked me, she said, uh, quite reasonably, she said, uh, she said, how many candidates have you got? <laughs> and I, and I said, none, but you, I will have, so you should see me anyway. And she went, yeah, she went, yeah, all right then. And I went, see her. <laughs> And, and it's a bit like the point I made with the sandwich thing. You know, I think too many people who want to be self-employed just overanalyze and, and think everything has to be perfect before they embark on self-employment. 
And actually, it doesn't. You can start a recruitment business by just knocking on somebody's door and going, hello, I'm starting a recruitment business. And even if they say, how many candidates have you got? And the honest answer is none. You can still start a recruitment business. Yeah. Yeah. Because you will get candidates. It's inevitable. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is building relationships with people so that when you do, you can get in touch with them and go, hey, I've got some candidates. Are you interested? And that's how you start a recruitment business. And it went well. I mean, we ended yeah. up with 18 members of staff and two offices. And uh, it was a really great experience, Michael. It was brilliant. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. It was, re- it was, it was good. It was good. Again, I didn't get involved in the minutiae of the business because that's not my forte. I was the person that went out there and promoted the business and sold the services. That's what yes. I did. Yes. Yeah, that, that's my thing. And how many years did you do that? So I did that full time from 2000 to 2006. And then it started to be a bit patchy in 2006 because I started to get into training. Yes. I had illegal clients that I started to ask me if I would do some training for them, you know, in soft skills and things. Yeah. And, And I also met somebody that was running a very small training firm and I was doing a little bit of consultancy for them. Um, And then in 2007, I decided to join them full time and I had a year with them Um, and I I sold my shares at the beginning of 2007 in in the recruit business. I sold my shares Mm -hmm. and went into training full time because I needed to see whether I liked it uh, and perhaps more importantly, whether I was any good at it. Yes. Still very well wanting to be, you know, I don't know, somebody, one of your listeners who wants to start a, a business making cakes. Well, that's all very laudable. But what if you're really crap at cake making? You know, yes. it's a bit of a waste of time, isn't it? Yes. Um, so I worked for them for a year and then it was inevitable. And I knew when I was working for them that I would go self-employed again because I'm just I'm just no good with holiday request forms. <laughs> Um, no, I, honestly, I, honestly, honestly, I, ha- I have to say this, and I have to say this to your, li- your listeners. Mm. I, I, and it's a very personal thing because obviously, having run a business with eighteen members of staff, you do, you know, people for the for the efficient working of a business, you can't have everybody off at the same time. So people must put in holiday request. Yeah. You know, requests for holiday. Otherwise, yeah. it would just be mayhem, wouldn't it? Yeah. But but as somebody, but <laughs> but on the flips. Right. Seriously, you know, the idea of having to ask somebody if it's all right if I spend time with my children, I just find deeply offensive. I just mm. think, no, no, I'm not doing that. Mm. Do you know what? If I want to go to the dentist or I don't want to work today or I want to spend some my time with my children, I bloody well will. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and so I went self-employed and I started this business, the business I'm I run now in in January two thousand eight. Mm. I so I have I'm curious because mm-hmm. when you were doing the recruiting, you yeah. said somebody asked you to do some soft skills training, yes. right? Yes, yes. So f- my, I'm curious, how did they know you could do training? And how okay. did they know you could do okay. soft skills training? <laughs> okay, first of all, the first bit that I didn't know that I could do training. Right. I had no idea. Uh, I'll tell you how this happened. I met two young, actually three young guys who had started a legal magazine in Scotland. Yes. And they'd started it from scratch. And they'd got, there was, they'd got to a point where there was about five or six of them all together and they're running this magazine. And how the mag- magazine funded itself, as all magazines do, is through advertising. Yes. But we, and, and I'd, I'd got to meet these three guys and we were having a coffee one morning or one afternoon. And, and Steve, who was the, the main, he was the, 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 the guy given the title of publisher, was saying, you know, we've got to sell advertising space in this thing, but we don't really know what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, I said, you know, my first ever job was selling ad space in a in a big directory. Of it wasn't course. a magazine, but it yeah. was a directory. Yeah. I said, I might be able to help you with that. And he said, oh, would you? Would, would you? I went, yeah, yeah, why not? Why don't I just, you know, put together a kind of course or something and give you, you know, a a two to three hours kind of training on how to sell? Mm. I went, oh, that would be brilliant. And we arranged a a fee. I seem to recall it was 200 quid I said that I would do it for. And I went, yeah, that's fine. So then what I did was (laughs) 
and uh, not a blind panic. I, I, I started to write down all the things that I'd learned selling and when I was taught how to sell. And I, and I also book, bought about four or five books on how to sell. Right. Um, and I, I'd, I'd read stuff about goal setting. You know, I'd read, um, um, oh, what's his name? Tony Robbins' yes. book, you know, Awaken the Giant Within yes. and, and Unlimited Power. So yes. there's all stuff about focus and vision and, and all these kind of things. And I cobbled together uh, three hours worth of material and I typed it out on some paper and I bought myself um, 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 a portable flip chart that folded up, you know, flip chart stand yes. and a flip chart pad and some big marker pens. And and I remember carrying this thing. I tell you what, they said it was portable. You, honestly, you needed to be the world's strongest <laughs> man to carry this so-called portable thing. Right. And if anybody knows the streets of Edinburgh, you know, it's all uphill and downhill and cobbled streets. That's right. So I lug this thing across to this little office and and set it up and 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 do this this course mm. and they really really liked it and then he said oh well my girlfriend she's the advertising manager for a, a magazine in edinburgh she said and her team might need some help with this so i ended up training them mm. and and that's again that's how i got into that and you know a bit like the sandwiches somebody years ago it's a network event. Said, "Oh, you, 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 you're training. You're in a training business. What, what training did you have to become a trainer?" Yeah. And and I have to say, I looked at her really, really quizzically because at one, I'd never been asked that question, and two, it had never occurred to me that you needed any training to become a trainer. All you have to do is actually write a course or write some in, write down what it is that you know in a sensible, ordered fashion in which you could talk about it for a couple of hours to people who don't know anything about it. Yeah. Well, that's how I got into training. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> incredible. <laughs> the The thing is, because I, I I believe you make it sound so super simple. This is it what... is. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not find Michael that yeah. people in the world just people over? I mean, there'll be people listening to this podcast who work in huge organisations who are constantly out having their their head in their hands because people around them are over complicating and over analyzing stuff instead of just getting on and doing. Yes. You know, and I was listening to a bit of an interview with, with Steve Jobs with Apple and he said, you know, you know, starting a business is, is about failing. And if you're not failing in a business, that means you're not trying. Mm. So you deliver a course and some of it works and some of it doesn't work. So guess what? The next time you deliver it, you miss out the bit that doesn't work, but do more of the stuff that does work. And it becomes an iterative process. And this, mm. the course just develops and it becomes re and you refine it and you refine it. And and ten years, ten and a half years on, Michael, I'm still refining it. I'm still dropping things and adding things. And this, my courses just evolve naturally because yeah. I'm constantly learning new stuff and going, oh, I'll put this in this course. Oh, I'll add this and oh, I'll talk about this. Yeah. But you have to start somewhere. You know, if you're going to be self-employed, there has to be a time when you go, well, that's it. I'm now self-employed. Mm. This is the day that I'm doing this. Yeah. And you either you know, you either do it or you don't do it. It's a bit like leaving the EU, and that might be a bit com controversial, but I don't care. Mm. You know, if you're going to leave the EU, leave. That's right. And, and you know what? You'll then have to make it work. That's right. I mean, that's my view, is yeah. then, you have, well, you have to make it work. Are we all going to starve to death if we leave the EU and don't get a deal with the EU? No. no. Of course we're not going to starve to death. Do you know what? We'll have to be resilient. It'll be difficult at first, but we're a country full of really intelligent people and we'll crack on. <laughs> so let's shall we just get on with it just get on with it stop just talking get about it, it. Get on with yeah. it. that's right stop talking about it just get on with it mm. <laughs> anyway that's i'm sorry it's, i'm going it, straight into politics there aren't i no but but it's a massive metaphor for running your business is yes you know and the nike logo says it all just do it just, just get do it on. yeah just, just do, do it. it yes so that's right so so then of course you work for that training company and yes. then you decided to create your own one. Yes. And and today, so tell us, what is your target market and what's the kind of training that you do today? Okay. Well, um, 
early on, um, and again, what I, one of the things I teach is business development. And the first thing I teach people is you must have a target. You, you must know the organizations, the geographical area, and the people, the decision makers within those areas. And you find those people out. You find them and you find out who those are. And you must have a target. Um, and I decided quite early on in my business that I would target the legal sector. One, because I had been a lawyer, albeit briefly. Yeah. Um, I had recruited into the legal sector, so I knew about it and I knew how law firms functioned. Yes. Um, but two other things, which I think are very important. One, I like working with lawyers. I mean, seriously, if you're going to be self-employed, one of the joys about being self-employed is you can choose who it is that you want to work with. Well, for goodness sake sell to people that you like or you respect <laughs> we just <laughs> don't sell to people you don't like mm. um and also and this is very important and this goes back full circle to the lesson i learned in in selling sandwiches is lawyers have got a lot of money yeah you know that seriously there is no and i say this to people there is absolutely no point in starting a business and trying to sell to a sector or organizations that don't have any money. Yeah. It's why very, very early on, I decided not to work with local government, government or anything to do with government. Mm. One, you have to jump, jump through a million ho hoops in terms of procurement. Yeah. And actually, it only ever comes down to cost. So why are you bothering? And two, they haven't got any money. Yeah. I mean, who? it would be like trying to sell things to the Greeks or the Italians at the moment. These countries don't have any money. Why are you selling anything to them? Mm. You know, pick lawyers. They're absolutely loaded. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because I'm, I'm talking about the big commercial law firms. I'm of not course. talking about your little high street solicitors. My clients are big global or national law firms. Yeah. And, um, you know, they make cash. And, and, and also they need what I do. So, so, so I don't just work with lawyers. But 98% um, of my working life is spent with lawyers by choice. And I love, I didn't like being a lawyer, but I really love working with them. And is it only around business development or is it other soft skills? Or? Um, it's business development, building business relationships. I suppose you might call that networking, but it's a bit more than networking other than just the mechanics of working a room. So building business relationships. Um, influence the persuasion and negotiation, which is what I'll be doing with lawyers tomorrow and what I was doing with lawyers from across the world in Paris over the weekend, a big international conference that was about influence and persuasion um, and also presentation skills. Yeah. So, again, just gone in Paris on Saturday morning. I was talking about presentation skills, how to stand up and speak and present, mm. um, you know, and that means not reading out loud from 27 PowerPoint slides. Mm. Yeah. Um, so those those are the key things I do. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think persuasion is really really massive at the moment, and I I the reason I'm saying it's massive is because of what's happening, are by the tech companies, mm -hmm. um, and what they're doing in terms of you know the kind of brainwashing that they're doing. Yes. So so. I'm just intrigued because you mentioned that word. Yes. Um, how can we be persuasive with integrity? <laughs> well, here's the great news mm. is we, we're all persuading and influencing people every day of the week with friends and families, family and colleagues, and you don't give it a moment's thought. Mm. I mean, I mean, you know, seriously. So, so um, I, I don't know. So some of your listeners would like to go out, see a film at the weekend, and then go and see, and, they'll, and, they'll, and then have a, an Italian meal. But their, their partner is reluctant. No, 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 let's stay in this weekend. I'd much rather stay in. Yeah. But, you know, over the, a period of, I don't know, a few minutes or a few hours or a few days, they persuade their partner. Yeah, go on then, we'll go to the cinema. And they've not thought about the process of how they do that. And yet that's what they do. And we're, we're born doing this. I mean, if you want absolute masters at influence of persuasion, it's babies. I mean, babies, babies are, are, are helpless things. They can't speak. And yet they they have adults running around doing things for them. Yes. And, 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 uh, yes. Well, yes. What, and, and what they're doing is, you know, and I wouldn't know. I, I suspect, we, uh, you know, in in. Um, in common with your listeners, I wouldn't normally 
wipe crap off somebody's backside at three o'clock in the morning. Not even my best mate, even if you really, really tried to persuade me and ask me really, really nicely. Yes. But both my sons had me up at three o'clock in the morning wiping crap off their backsides. Well, how did they do that? And and kids retain that. You know, we're we're hurtling towards Christmas now. But, you know, when the children start persuading mum and dad as to what it is they would like for Christmas, well, months in advance. Yes. Months in advance. Yeah. Um, and it's because they haven't learnt the wrong way and they don't overthink it. Mm. The fact is people in business tend to overthink how yeah. to influence and persuade and, 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 and actually use too much logic really, rather mm. than appealing to people's gut feelings and emotions, because we know that people make decisions emotionally and then justify them to themselves. So so you are using techniques that you're right, the, the big IT people, your Googles and your Apples and your Amazons and your Facebooks um, um, are doing anyway, um, you know, things like social proof and scarcity. Mm. And, and to explain what I mean by that, I, I suspect everybody has clicked onto um, uh, a hotel uh, booking site. You know, you want to book a, a couple of nights accommodation. Yes. And they all use this thing where they're going, uh, well, uh, we've only we've only got one room left That's right. uh, on the particular days you're looking for, and f- seven other people are currently looking at that date. Yes. Well, they're using two things there. Uh, one is scarcity. In other words, there's only one left. And how they're ramping up the pressure is, and what's more, you might miss out if you don't act quickly because seven other people are looking at it. Um, and then also... They've got, you know, they've got the trip advisor rating it next to it. Mm. And, and that's using another technique in influence persuasion, which is called social proof. And social proof is basically, well, what's everyone else doing? Yes. So, if it, so in, in other words, if you look at those ratings and you go, oh, well, this must be the right hotel to book in. Amazon use that, of course, don't they? Because you buy a book or you buy an, an item on Amazon. And at the bottom, it says people who bought this also bought this yes and you go oh oh yes i'll have that (laughs) right right and but but but, uh, do you know and i was reading this recently mike i was reading it literally about three or four weeks ago the the, one of the first people to ever understand the psychology of how people buy was a guy called daniel kahneman and some of your listeners will have come across daniel kahneman's book it's called thinking fast and slow and Daniel Kamen won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2000, which is very unusual because he was the first non-economist to do so. He's right. a psychologist. Right. Uh, and, and through extensive research, he really got to the nitty gritty of how you get people to buy. And what I was reading Michael, the other day was the fact that Jeff Bezos, who, who started Amazon, plus the two guys that started Google and, and, and Zuckerberg, both went to see him, all went to see him very, very early on and said and asked him, tell us how you influence and persuade people. Right. And he told them and they took it and went right. And that's why things like Facebook have done so, so very well. And you think about what Facebook's done, Michael. Facebook basically has persuaded people, tell us everything about yourself so that we can flog it to advertisers. Mm. And people in their millions have done that willingly. Willingly told people everything about themselves so that Mark Zuckerberg can become a multi-billionaire flogging that information to advertisers. Mm. And people have done that willingly. I know. Now, that's clever. Yeah. (laughs) Whether that's moral, I don't know. But that's bloody clever. Yeah. And, and and the term they give to influence persuasion is nudging, because what you're doing is nudging people. So people are just nudged. So they're not aware that they're being influenced, persuaded. It's just like there's the little back of a hand just slightly guiding, just slightly just moving you in the direction that they want you to go. Mm. And he's done that superbly well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's really. scary, isn't it? Very, very. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's why I asked the question: How we do that? Um, I'm not looking for the f- the full answer because there isn't a simple answer. I'm sure. It's, no, no, it's no, how no, we, no, no. How we do this with, you know, our own little businesses in a micro way because we're not yes. as big as these tech companies. But no. how we do it with integrity 
that you know make sure that we're not people don't feel like they've been duped because there's lots of people trying to do it you know they're trying to dupe people into buying something or booking something or um, yes and i see you know some of my connections doing it and i'm going i can see what they're trying to do that yes, yes because yes, yes. everybody is teaching them those methods yes yes and i think maybe online it's a bit more i don't i, I don't Unless you have got an online business, and I don't have an online business, my business is me selling what it is that I do. Yes, actually, what it comes do, down to, as with many people's business, is 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 personal relationship, is an ability to build a relationship with another human being. Yeah. Um, but within that, there are there there are certain there are certain things that human beings do that that make us amenable to doing things for people and they say these are not machiavellian it's a very simple thing to which everybody can relate to um is if i'm at a networking event and somebody hands me their business card it is just it is unspoken that i will give them a business card back yes i mean that's just and and most of your listeners as well well that's just polite it is polite, but actually at the root of that is this deep-seated need for human beings to reciprocate. Mm. It's just the norm. It's like everybody within a group of friends or within a work office, you know, work environment, knows those people who don't buy a round of drinks. <laughs> don't we? I mean, you, and, and, and you identify them quite quickly. Those people within groups of others are spotted quite quickly as that person that... Or, or they don't. It's they don't take it. They don't. They don't brew up when everyone knows it's their turn to brew up or their turn to get the donuts. Mm. Well, well, from one angle you go, okay. So reciprocity is one way that you get people to do things for you. But I want your listeners to understand that that's just that's just deep within us. This reciprocal thing. It's like you know, if you've been to my house for dinner and wine and, and an entertaining evening that we we both know that you're probably going to reciprocate mm. because it's it, it's just it, that's the human norm to do that yes and actually if we invited you again and then a third time and you've still not reciprocated we probably think a little ill of you wouldn't we because that's no because that's not the norm is it no. and yet and yet that is influencing people, isn't it? That's, yes. That's influencing. And, and one of the leading authorities on this is a guy called Robert Cialdini. And Robert Cialdini, again, is a, a social psychologist. And, and your listeners should look him up on Amazon or Google, having mentioned those two things, mm. um, because you'll see, you'll see stuff by him in the two books he's written. But, but he, he talks about um, a moment, a golden, a golden moment in that reciprocal arrangement. So, so typically, let's say I do some work for you, or uh, and you say, "Oh, thanks, Nick. Thank you so much for doing that. I really, really appreciate it." And no money's going to exchange hands here, by the way. You, you just asked me for a favour, and I do it for you. Yes. Um. Uh, and you go, "Thanks a lot, Nick. I really appreciate it." And I go, "Listen, Michael, no problem at all. I, 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 that, honestly, no trouble at all, mate." And we leave it at that. What What Cialdini says is actually what I should do at that point. He say to you, "Listen, no problem at all, Michael. No, no absolute pleasure. Listen, I, I know you do the same for me." If, if 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 the tables were reversed yeah. and what what i'm doing there is planting a little seed in your brain that says you owe me one and we both know that you do yeah. now s some of your listeners might be thinking well that's a little bit underhand but that's just that's just human nature that that's 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 what we do yes and and it's also human nature for the social proof thing I mean, we all like to think we're free thinking, autonomous individuals, but we're not. We're sheep. I mean, it's, it, deep, it's deep within us it, it, from a survival point of view to simply do what other people are doing. Yeah. Because if we're, you know, cave people living in and in and around our cave and, you know, there's 35 people in our little community and 34 of them run in one direction, it's probably in my interest to run in the same direction. Mm from a survival point of view because there's probably a reason why you've all run in that direction and and our brains are still hardwired to react in that kind of way so so that's what we do yes. and and the yes. the business people listening to this will will know that because all the time they'll get asked well who else do you do work for 
So I'm constantly asked, Michael. So when people think about using my training services, they will always ask me, so, so Nick, how, who else do you do work for? Yes. And I, I wouldn't dream of turning around to them and saying, well, why do you need to know that? Aren't you capable of making an independent decision? <laughs> Exactly. I mean, you laugh at that yeah. because it's so ridiculous, because it's so hardwired into us mm. to seek clarification that we are making or we have about to make, we are about to, or we have made the right decision. So what people are looking for there is reassurance when I give them a list of clients of other law firms that I've worked for that are choosing Nick is the right thing to do. Why? Well, because all these other people have done the same thing. That's social proof. Now, that's not Machiavellian. That's not underhand. That's just, as human beings, we look for that. TripAdvisor just taps into that. Oh, yeah. this must be the hotel to stay at. This must be the restaurant to go at. Because look, it's got five stars. Mm. Mm. We're just reassured we're making the right decision. I mean, are you prepared to go to the restaurant that's only got one star mm. in its ratings on TripAdvisor? Probably not. And yet you might love it. Yeah. But are you going to take that chance? And yeah. uh, no, I've just got the one that's dead popular. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nick, thank you. I, I so appreciate some of that information because it is so important for people to understand it what, is the psychology of it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. actually, the way that you explain it, which I have experienced from you before is you say it in such a simple way for people to understand it rather than overcomplicating it, which is what I think you are all about. Right? You know, just keep it simple. But keep it simple. And and it's actually the things that we already know anyway. Yes, so. that's right. That, that's right. So when I'm teaching influence persuasion, which I'll be doing tomorrow to him, to lawyers, I'll be just saying to them, you know, keep it simple. Yeah. Just simple messages, you know, and you mentioned one earlier on, which is Nike's just do it. Mm. But it could be L'Oreal's because you're worth it. Or it could be Donald Trump's make America great again or Obama's. Yes, we can. I mean, everyone's trying to just simplify mm. because the brain can't take much information, actually. No. Nick, I, I, we could talk literally for hours. It's super fascinating. And I know you've got to get on and do other things. So thank you so much for your my time. My pleasure. Really my pleasure. Sharing your story. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So uh, how can people get in touch with you? Because I'm sure there will be some people who would like to use you. <laughs> okay, quite, quite possibly. Yeah. Um, and listen to uh, read the drivel that I put on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, um, so I suppose the easiest thing to do is go to my website and then you can they can see videos of me talking about the things that i do little short videos yes which which are set against the wonderful historic streets of london the vast majority of them uh, and that would be all the w's of course yeah um 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 r g training so for for really great training so r for romeo g for golf training dot co dot uk Brilliant. And they can find you on LinkedIn as well. And, and they can find me on LinkedIn. And uh, I do have a book published, uh, yeah. which is an, on Amazon, uh, which is called How to Be Great at the Stuff You Hate. Love the title. Yeah. Uh, which is about uh, practice. And I wrote it for people who either find themselves in a sales business development role within an employed position, and yet they don't see them as sales see themselves as, as salespeople and for people who want to start their own business and have got a skill but have no idea how you start a business you know from scratch mm. and no I don't talk about business plans and no I don't talk about financial planning and filling out excel spreadsheets what I talk about is the practicality of how you start a business so that's how to be great at the stuff you hate and they should buy it because yeah. I get royalties and uh, I spend it on wine <laughs> So, I mean, <laughs> I it's a great little book, and I have certainly um, read it, and it I, I've really enjoyed it because of the simplicity of it, Good. and the, the simple, uncomplicated language that you use, which I I'm a, being a Dutchman, I I don't like difficult English, so <laughs> it has really helped me enormously, definitely. Good. Good. Um. So, with that said. Hopefully mm -hmm. we will meet again 
in the future. That would be wonderful, Michael. If, if you are ever in Birmingham, do let me know. I, I will buy you a coffee to say Splendid. thank you. I might even buy you lunch if you want, if you have time. Bless your heart. Um, and thank you so much for coming on the My podcast. My pleasure. And thanks for everybody that listens. Thank you. Take care and all the best. Bye for now. Cheers, mate. Ta-da, bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 